Hello everybody, my name is Martijn Fransen. I represent Panalytical, one of the leading manufacturers of X-ray diffraction equipment. X-ray diffractometers are the main instruments used for studying the crystallographic properties of matter. In this short presentation I want to show you a few examples of the importance of crystallography in our daily lives. Many substances found in nature are crystalline. Crystals appear in nature as a result of volcanic activity, are formed under high pressure or crystallize from water. Here you see beautiful gypsum crystals that grew during thousands of years deep under the ground. They were found recently by accident during mining activities in Nica, Mexico. These crystals are extraordinarily large in size, they are meters long. Note the small human figure at the bottom right of the picture. In most cases, however, the crystallites found in nature are much smaller in size. Most rocks, soils and sands consist of small submillimeter particles, such as the iron containing rocks shown here. In this image, a cross section of a rock fragment prepared for the optical microscope shows the small crystallographic domains in the rocks. The crystallographic properties of such rocks can be investigated with X-ray diffractometers. In this slide you see the Empyrean Panalytical's multipurpose X-ray diffractometer meant for the analysis of powders, thin films, nanomaterials and solid objects. In the logo of the International Year of Crystallography you can see how a single crystal diffracts X-rays into beautiful diffraction patterns. Bragg's law determines at which angle a single crystal will give a diffraction signal. Also polycrystalline materials or powders give diffraction patterns. Of the many small crystallites contained in the powder, only the ones with the right orientation will provide the strong diffraction signals. Because the diffraction signal will come from multiple crystallites, the powder pattern can also be used to determine the constitution of mixtures. The orange trace that you see here is a diffractogram. It consists of many peaks recorded as a function of the diffraction angle. From the angular position of the peaks, the different components of a mixture, also called the phases in the mixture, can be determined. From the relative intensity of the peaks, the relative abundance of the phases can be computed. A powder pattern is like a unique fingerprint of the material. Such a diffractogram can also be obtained from solid objects, such as rocks and metals. These objects consist internally out of many small crystallites and produce their own unique powder patterns. Powder diffractograms can be recorded for many of the substances that we find in the world around us. These materials determine the quality of our daily lives. Let's have a look at the importance of understanding the crystallography of powders and other crystalline mixtures. Cement is the main construction material for the buildings in which we live. Controlling the workability, the setting time and the final strength of the concrete is determined by the crystallographic properties of cement. In fact, the quality of the structures we create is determined by the crystallographic phase changes during cement hardening, a process still not fully understood by today's scientists. Cement is made by heating limestone and other raw materials in a long rotary oven called a kiln. In the kiln, the substances undergo crystallographic changes at temperatures up to 1400 degrees Celsius, yielding a material called clinker, which is ground afterwards and mixed with other constituents in order to create cement. The making of cement results in significant emission of carbon dioxide, CO2 one of the gases responsible for global warming. For each kilogram of cement, almost one kilogram of CO2 is produced, creating about 5% of the CO2 emissions resulting from human activities. It is the second source of CO2 emission after power generation. Of the total CO2 emission in the cement production process, the majority stems from limestone calcination, 30% comes from the fuel needed to heat the kiln. The final 10% is needed for grinding of the clinker, transport of the materials through the plants and so on. Attempts to reduce CO2 emission focus on two aspects. First, make cement with less clinker. 
industrial byproducts such as fly ash from power plants or slags from iron blast furnaces are used for this. These materials also have a cementitious effect. Secondly, alternative fuels can be used for heating the kiln, such as plastic wastes, animal carcasses or used car tires. The understanding of the crystallographic properties of the cement are essential for producing cements with low CO2 emission. Another important material in our daily lives is iron. The starting point for all iron is the ore, which is dug from the ground in mines. The quality of the ore in a mine is never constant. It was determined millions of years ago when the rocks were formed. The classical and simple way for determining the quality of the ore is by visual inspection. For iron ore, the quality is judged by visual comparing the color with a reference set. From such a visual inspection, different parts of the ore body can be classified as low grade or high grade. By determining the crystallography, however, a much finer classification of the ore body can be made. Using this approach makes the ore much more constant in quality it increases the profitability of the mining activities as less waste is created and it reduces the damage to the environment. Another important aspect of crystallography is the understanding of crystal deformation. When you were in an airplane traveling, did you ever wonder why the windows in a plane are oval and not rectangular in shape? Airplanes and other machinery are subject to cyclic loads during operation like takeoff and landing. After many repeated loads, cracks can form at the surface, which can suddenly propagate through the hull assembly, causing failure, the so-called metal fatigue. Metal fatigue was not fully understood when the first commercial jet airplanes were built. The de Havilland Comet was an example of such a jet airplane, which was built in the 50s. After a successful introduction of the airplane, two of these planes crashed after more than one year of successful operation in a short period of time. All planes were grounded and the investigation started. The repeated loads on the airplane's body were simulated by placing one of the remaining airplanes in a water tank, which was repeatedly pressurized and depressurized. After more than 3000 cycles, the plane body suddenly burst open. The investigation showed that a fatigue crack had occurred at the corner of a rectangular window. From the simulated stresses in the window frame, you can see that these stresses are much higher in rectangular corners than in rounded ones. So nowadays, airplane windows have rounded corners. A further improvement of the mechanical components in airplanes and other machines was obtained by deliberate generation of compressive stress in the surface of the metallic components causing microcracks to stay closed and therefore reducing the chance of metal fatigue. Nowadays metal parts undergo a treatment by shot peening which adds this compressive stress in the top surface and metal fatigue problems are largely overcome. Understanding of crystallographic deformation is essential for making the safe and long lasting machines that we use in our daily lives. Microelectronic devices such as computers and cell phones have also become an essential part in our daily lives, especially for the youngest generation. Cell phones have become so small and powerful because of our understanding of crystallography. With this understanding, we have created smaller and more powerful batteries, as well as energy efficient components such as the backlight of the screens in our cell phones. Cell phone backlights are made from gallium nitride, a semiconducting material. These backlights consist of many thin layers which should have the right crystallographic properties for a good working device. Let's have a look at controlled crystal growth. Gallium nitride backlights, like other microelectronic components, consist of many layers of different materials which are grown on single crystal substrates in chemical vapor deposition reactors. Depending on the growth conditions in the reactor, such layers can be relaxed and there is no relation with the crystal structure of the substrate or strained, the layer is deformed and matches the crystallographic structure of the substrate. 
These trained layers are essential for the correct functioning of the device. X-ray diffraction is used to probe the crystallographic quality of these layers. Well-produced LEDs result in energy-efficient, long-lasting cell phone screens. Again, understanding crystallography is essential for our daily lives. The growth and aging of the world population asks for availability of pharmaceutical materials for everyone. Understanding the crystallography of pharmaceuticals is essential for the development and production of safe medicines. The rotating molecule is thalidomide, a drug developed in the 50s, which was found to have adverse effects on unborn children. A crystallographic property common in organic molecules is polymorphism, the ability of the molecule to crystallize in different forms. Here you see two forms of indomethacine, a strong painkiller. We need to understand these crystallographic forms in order to make safe pharmaceuticals. By measuring the crystallography, we can also check the authenticity of the drug. Counterfeiting of pharmaceuticals is a widespread problem and is a potential threat to the safety of our population. Counterfeiting is less risky than narcotics trafficking. Here you see two diffractograms of alpha and gamma indomethacine. Since the two polymorphs have a different crystal structure, both diffractograms are different. X-ray powder diffraction is the only tool to readily distinguish between different polymorphs of a compound. Crystallography is also important for feeding our growing population. Fertilizers are essential nowadays for improving the yield of agriculture. Understanding the crystallography of soils and fertilizers helps to optimize the fertilizer for the crops which are to be grown. Access to drinking water is a growing problem in many areas of the world. The water in our rivers is often too polluted or used for irrigation, causing water shortages for the population downstream. Making drinking water from the sea, so-called desalination, is a growing activity. Understanding the crystallography of the membranes and filters is important for building desalination plants with reduced power consumption. Finally, crystallographic substances are present in many food substances we take. Chocolate is a tasteful crystallographic substance. So crystallography is not only essential for our daily lives, it also adds taste. In this presentation I've shown you that crystallography is essential in various aspects of our daily lives. It is a great initiative by United Nations to declare 2014 the International Year of Crystallography. You are welcome to learn more about crystallography in our daily lives at our Panalytical website and during the open laboratory events that we are organizing throughout 2014 together with the International Union of Crystallography and UNESCO. Thank you very much for your attention.